As part of my day job, I've analyzed hundreds of different code bases. Most of them open source, but also a lot of proprietary and commercial code bases. And today, I want to share some of my observations with you. Because there are some patterns that I see recur over and over again, and those patterns are independent of programming language or technology. And I want to do this in a different way. Because I'm pretty convinced that we, as an industry, we know what good code looks like. We know about the importance of naming, testability, cohesion, and all that other stuff. So today, I want to go beyond that. Instead, I'm going to start with data analysis. Because isn't it fascinating that data analysis has become mainstream? And the rise of machine learning has taught us how to find patterns in complex phenomena. Yet, we as developers have never taken those techniques and turned them on ourselves to understand our own behavior and how our code bases grow. So that's what I want to do today. I want to show you how behavioral data about us as developers can help us make better decisions. Decisions that guide us towards maintainable code bases. And the good news are that you all already have all the data that you need. We're just not used to think about it that way. I'm talking about our version control systems. Our version control data is a perfect behavioral log of how we as developers have interacted with our code. So let's uncover the secrets of version control data. My first observation is that maintainable code goes way beyond technology. And we as developers, we tend to be pretty good on the technical part of that. But my experience is that we often miss the social implications of our designs. Let's see why that is important. This is what pretty much every system that I've worked with over the past 10 years has looked like. We have a number of big subsystems, usually free, that we somehow integrate and let them exchange information. And at one end, we have a big database. Now, each one of those subsystems can be fairly large. They can consist of hundreds of thousands or even million lines of code. And the scale of that alone makes it really, really hard to reason about it. But this is not just about scale, because today's systems tend to be written in multiple different programming languages. And of course, they are developed by multiple programmers organized into multiple teams. And that leaves everyone with their own view of how the system looks. No one has a holistic picture. But this isn't really just about technology, because systems that look like this tend to come with an organization that looks like that. So our main challenge is to balance these technical and social organizational complexities. And this is actually a hard problem, but it's a problem that we can simplify somehow by understanding the next point here. My next observation is that all code is equal, but some code is more equal than others. And to explain what I mean about that, I want to share a little story to you. This is something that happened to me a number of years ago. At that time, I was working on a large legacy code base. And what we did was we bought a tool that was able to measure a bunch of different complexity measures and produce something called a technical depth metric. So we basically took that tool, threw it at our code base, and out came a prioritized list of every module in the system. And each module had a technical depth number assigned to it. The interesting thing here was that there was a clear number one candidate. There was one piece of code that was way worse than the rest of it. However, when we started to investigate that piece of code, it turned out that that code had been stable for three years. We never needed to touch it. It worked wonderfully in production. It just did its job. So should we really spend time and effort improving that piece of code? What can we expect to gain? To me, it's just a big risk. And besides, we probably all have much more urgent matters to attend to. And to find us those matters, we need to do something differently. We need to take an evolutionary look at our code. Here's how it looks like. 
Please have a look at these different graphs. All of them shows the same thing. On the x-axis, you have each file in the system, and those files are sorted according to their change frequencies. That is, how many commits have we done that influence that particular file, and the number of commits is what you see on the y-axis. Now, the interesting thing here is that what you see here are three radically different code bases, written in completely different program languages, and with completely different lifetimes. Yet, they all show the same pattern. You see a power law distribution. And this is something I've seen in every single code base that I've analyzed. Most, uh, what this means to you is that in your typical system, most of your work tends to be in a relatively small part of the code base. And most of your code is in the long tail, which means it's rarely, if ever, touched. And this is important because it gives us a tool to prioritize, to focus on the code that really matters. So now, we're able to narrow down the amount of code we need to inspect if we want to make a real improvement that matters in terms of productivity. And this is a good starting point, but we need to do even better. And to explain how, I need to take a little risk. I'm going to put up a slide, and I think this is the point in the presentation where you will all vehemently disagree with me. But here we go. When it comes to maintainable code bases, complexity isn't the problem. We developers, we are so conditioned to despise bad code. We have learned that we need to refactor bad code as we see it, and we have learned that we need to keep all our code clean and nice, and that that is the fastest way forward. The problem I have with that? It's just not true. And the graph on the previous page indicates why that may be the case. But still, we cannot discard complexity entirely. We just need to find out when complexity matters and when it doesn't. And this is a problem I've been struggling with for years. Then five years ago, I was working again on a fairly large system with a lot of people, and at the same time, I was enrolled into university where I took a course in forensic psychology. And I think that uh, forensics, in general, has a really beautiful mindset that replies well to software development as well. But there was one technique in particular that I really want to show you. This is a technique called geographical offender profiling. Geographical offender profiling is a technique that we use to catch serial offenders. And you see an example here of how it looks. This is a map over a city, a city that looks pretty much like London. And you see those green dots? Each one of those dots represents a crime scene. We have 56 different crime scenes. And we know that those 56 crimes are committed by the same offender. How do we know it's the same offender? Well, perhaps we have uh, hard evidence like DNA or fingerprints, or we have just found that it's the same modus operandi, the same method of operation used by the criminal at the different crime scenes. Now, what you do in geographical offender profiling is that you use the distribution of those crimes to calculate a probability surface. And that probability surface is in part a mathematical weighting of the distribution of the crimes, but we also weight that formula with our knowledge of human behavior. And using this probability surface, we are now able to predict the most probable home location of our offender. And that's there in the red area, and that's what you call a hotspot. And according to the research, there's a 70% chance that our offender will have his home base there. And the reason I think this applies well to software is because think about what we have done. We have taken a potentially vast geographical area and narrow it down to a much, much smaller part. A much smaller part where we can now focus our human expertise and still be pretty sure that we catch that offender. So what if we could do this in software? What if we could take those horrible million lines of code and narrow them down to a few hotspots and know that if we focus on improvement there, we get a real effect? Let's see how that may look in software. Here we go. 
So this is a geographical offender profile of a fairly large system. What you see there is approximately 300,000 lines of code. And that data here is built up from a version control system, our behavioral log. And it's based on 2,400 different commits. And by identifying patterns in those commits, we're able to pro project a probability surface onto our code. And using that probability surface, we're able to predict the most probable maintenance savings in that code. Now, I'm going to walk you through this visualization in a minute, but before I do that, I just want to point out that a hotspot analysis like this is actually a social analysis. Because this data is based on the collective intelligence of all contributing authors. All right, so what do you see? You see that there are some large blue circles. Each one of those large blue circles represents a subsystem. This is a hierarchical visualization, so it pretty much follows the folder structure of your project. And when you do detailed and large-scale visualizations, it's also vital that you keep them interactive, so that we can zoom in and out to the level of detail of interest. And if you zoom in on one of those subsystems, you will see that we represent each file as a circle. You will also see that those circles have different sizes. And that's because size is used to represent complexity. So complexity is something you measure from the code. And we have a bunch of different complexity measures to choose from. And you can basically pick any metric you want, because what they all have in common is that they are equally bad. So I tend to go with the simplest possible thing. I tend to pick the number of lines of code, which also has the advantage of being language neutral. But still, I said a minute ago that complexity alone isn't a problem. So we need something else. We need to understand if we actually work in that code or not. We need to understand the change frequency of a code. And this is something you pull out of your version control data. And the interesting thing here, of course, is when we combine these two dimensions. Because now, we're able to identify complicated code that we also have to work with often. And I want to show you a real-world case study of how this may look. This is a study of Microsoft's uh, open source project, Roslyn. And Roslyn is a really interesting project to study, because Roslyn is an open source compiler platform, and it actually includes two compilers itself. It includes the c -sharp compiler, written in c -sharp, and the Visual Basic compiler, written in Visual Basic. So Roslyn is a polyglot code base. Now, if you look at the top hotspots in Roslyn right now, you will see that the number one hotspot is something called command line tests, and written in c -sharp. Another top hotspot in Roslyn is called command line tests, and it's written in Visual Basic. Hmm. I wonder if there's some kind of relationship between those two. In a few minutes, we're going to see a technique that helps us answer that question. But for now, I just want to point out that those hotspots, they look tiny on screen. But that's just because the size of Roslyn. Roslyn is huge. What you see there is almost 4 million lines of code. And each one of those command line tests are a file with 7,000 lines of code. And I would also like to argue if you have 7,000 lines of code in a file called command line tests, perhaps that isn't a good unit of test. And what I would do in this case is that I would look for the different responsibilities and start to break that file down into separate test suites. For example, one for parsing, one for validation, one for uh, debug flags. And if you do that, each one of those new test files will, of course, become easier to reason about in isolation. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you end up with an entirely new context. Because now, if you continue to do a hotspot analysis like that, you will be able to see which parts of your solution that you managed to stabilize and which parts that continue to change. So cohesion is a tool that gives you additional insights into the evolution of your code. Another observation that I made, you saw that those two modules, they were uh, test code. And this is, again, something I've found over and over again, that the worst offenders in code tend to be in the test code. 
And I think the main reason for that is because we developers, we tend to make a mental divide. On one hand, we have the application code, and we know it's vital that we keep it clean, that it's possible to maintain and evolve it. On the other hand, we have the test code. And most of the time, we're happy if we get around to write any of it at all. And I think this is a dangerous fallacy, because from a maintenance perspective, there's really no difference between test code and application code. And if your tests lack in quality, they will hold you back. All right, so let's see what the hotspots actually brought us. When we add a complexity dimension, we're able to narrow down the amount of code we need to investigate even more. And I typically find that we're able to narrow down to just 3 to 6%, depending on the code base. And this is important because those 3 to 6%, they tell you which part of the code should we focus improvements on in order to get both improvement, improvements in both productivity and quality. And the reason I say quality is because hotspots tend to be strong predictor of defects. All right, so let's leave the hotspots now for a while and talk about something entirely different. Let's talk about our primary tool as software developers. And I'm not talking about the compiler, I'm not talking about the IDE, not Emacs, not even Vim. I'm talking about our brain. And the reason I want to talk about the brain is because your brain does not always work in your best interest. And to show you an example, I want to do a little poll here. Please, think back to the last large project that you worked on. Perhaps the project you work on right now. How many of you know where your hotspots are in that code base? A few of you, 10 people maybe. Please keep your hand up if you're 100% certain. Few of you, cool, great. You may well be right. What worries me though is that if 100 years of psychological research has taught us anything, it is that we humans, we can't really trust our own judgment. And to explain what I mean about that, we need to talk about something different. Yes, that's right, we need to talk about gorillas. So this is one of my favorite psychological experiments. You may well have heard about it, it's quite famous. It was done back in the 90s. And what the researchers did here was that they recorded a video of two teams that played basketball against each other. And your task as a participant in that experiment was to count the number of passes. Now, as you sat down and watched the two teams play basketball, something a bit strange happened. Because suddenly, a man dressed in a gorilla suit, walks across the basketball field, stops right in front of the camera, turns towards you and starts to beat on his chest. And then he walks off. After you've seen that video, the researchers will ask you, did you notice anything particular? And you would say, of course, yeah, a man dressed in gorilla suit. That's sure a bit odd, but that's not what happened. It turned out that more than 50% of the participants failed to see the gorilla. And a follow-up experiment revealed that people failed to see the gorilla even when it's right in front of their eyes. Even when the image of the gorilla hits our retinas, we fail to see it. And the reason for that is because you don't see with your eyes. You see with your brain. And in order to perceive something, we need to focus our attention on it. But your attention was directed to calculate the number of passes. And the question for us here is, if we're humans, if we are capable of missing something as obvious as a gorilla, what's the risk that we will miss the gorillas in our own code? What's the risk that we will overlook our hotspots? And I think it goes deeper than that, because now I've talked about the failure of the human mind a little bit, but it turns out we humans are actually really good at some things. And one thing we are exceptionally good at, that is to rationalize decisions and beliefs that we don't even share. So let me explain how that works. This is something completely different. If you took part in this experiment, what happened was that you get shown two pictures of two different faces. And your task as a participant is to 
select the face you find the most attractive. Once you have made your selection, the researchers will hand you a copy of that photo. Only they don't. They trick you. So you actually receive a copy of the photo that you didn't pick. And now they do something really, really evil. Because they ask you, please motivate your choice. Interesting. Let's think about that for a while. So we sit there with a copy of a photo that we didn't choose and are now asked to motivate a choice that we didn't do. And again, you would think that if something like that happens to you, you would of course notice immediately. And again, that's not what happened. It turned out that more than two thirds of the participants failed to notice the swap. And if you read our regional research, it's really great because they have a transcription of the interviews and the mot motives that people gave. So for example, you have this woman, who, uh, she says, yeah, I picked this photo because I really love the earrings. The photo that you actually picked don't show any earrings at all. And of course, there's this really confident man who says, yeah, I picked this photo because I really prefer blondes. In reality, the photo he picked showed a dark-haired woman. Now, what I've just told you about are two examples of cognitive biases on an individual level. But if you want to see a real disaster, here's what you do. You take a number of individuals, put them together, and call that a team. And to explain what I mean, we need to travel into what perhaps may look as some unethical corners. But I promise you, I will keep this nice, so please, just relax. Let me ask you a question instead. How many of you have been given the advice that if you want to make a real impact in a meeting, you should speak first? Just a few of you. Well, in this context, it's actually good advice, because it turns out that the first person who speaks in a meeting will bias the whole discussion, will bias the whole group. But there's an even sneakier way to get what you want. And this is something called vocal minorities. And vocal minorities are based upon the fact that we people, when we hear an opinion repeated over and over again, we come to believe that that opinion is more popular and widespread than it actually is. And that's true even when it's the same person repeating the same opinion over and over again. So all I have to do in order to manipulate you is to keep repeating things like, do you know that Common Lisp is a great programming language? <laughs> have you seen Common Lisp? It's an amazing language. Now, I try to be a good person, so I will only manipulate you in a good way. Common Lisp is indeed great. <laughs> but what if it was the other way around? For example, let's say someone complains a lot. Have you seen that network module code? It's crap. That network module code, we just have to throw it away, it's so lousy. How do you think that opinion will affect your idea on where your true hotspots are? And the reason I tell you this is because I really, really, really want to make the case for my next slide, because this is probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. Do use your intuition, do use your expertise, but make sure to support your decisions with data. All right, let's move on from gorillas and groups and all this stuff and talk about change patterns in our applications. And I want to talk about surprise and the cost of surprise. And the reason I want to talk about surprise is because surprise is one of the most expensive things you can put into a software architecture. And there are different kinds of surprises. I like to show you the first kind of surprise by showing you what has to be my all-time favorite code. This is really a work of art. This is the code from the Apollo project. So this is the code that actually took us to the moon. So please, have a look at this beauty. In particular, focus on the comments. <laughs> How many of you want to go to the moon on that code? <laughs> so one could argue that this is a surprise to the end user. That's not the kind of surprise I want to talk about today. 
I want to talk about the surprise we developers leave behind for the poor maintenance programmer coming after us. And I want to show you how a concept called temporal coupling helps us uncover those surprises. Now, temporal coupling is interesting because it's so different from the way we developers typically talk about um, coupling. When we developers talk about coupling, what we typically mean is a dependency between different parts and pieces. Temporal coupling is different because it's not measured from code. Temporal coupling is measured from the evolution of your code. So this is something we pull out of version control data. And temporal coupling is about files, two or more, that keep changing together over time, perhaps even in the same commit. And I want to show you how that looks by looking at another real-world system. This is a case study from uh, ASP.NET MVC. And ASP and .NET MVC, they tend to focus a lot on automated tests. So if you look at their code base, they actually have more test code than application code. And as a consequence, if you do a temporal coupling analysis, you will find that most of your temporal couples are between test code and the unit under test. And this is not a surprise at all. This is actually what we expect. In fact, I would be worried if that temporal dependency wasn't there, because it probably means our tests aren't being kept up to date. So what I tend to look for instead are temporal couples where I had no easy explanation, perhaps something like this. So in that code base, we have two different files. One is called script tag helper, and one is called a link tag helper. And if you look at the code, you will see that there's no immediate dependency between them yet they keep changing together in 89% of all commits. How can that happen? When I find something like that, I always look at the code. But today, I'm going to delegate that responsibility to you. So what will happen now is that I'm going to put up a copy of the script tag helper next to the link tag helper. Are you ready? Your task is to see if you can spot some kind of subtle pattern here. Are you ready? Here we go. Here's a script tag helper. Let's put the link tag helper next to it. Anyone notice a pattern? Yeah, this is what I find in quite a many cases, a dear old friend of mine, copy-paste. But I think I'm being a little bit unfair here because this is not really copy-paste. Because they have done something very rare. They have actually updated the copy-pasted property names. And even more rare, this is something you almost never find, they've updated a copy-pasted documentation. <laughs> so this, my friends, this is not really copy-paste, this is more like copy-paste with a gold plating. <laughs> but still, temporal coupling is a great tool to uncover surprises in our own code. But we can do even more with it. We can use it to analyze complete software architectures. And I'd like to show you an example from microservices. Why microservices? Because right now, microservices are all the rage. And that just means that tomorrow's legacy systems are going to be microservices. So this is what microservices look like in PowerPoint. In reality, they tend to look much more like this. So we are developers, so we have learned we need to abstract away shared functionality, so perhaps we introduce a shared communication library, and we notice some shared database access patterns, so let's abstract away those as well. And of course, we want to follow the recommendation of providing a shared service template so that all of our services behave in the same way. And obviously, we want to make our services as easy as consume as possible, so let's introduce a bunch of client libraries. Now, each one of those choices may well be good. What you have to watch out for, though, is that in microservices, loose coupling is king. As soon as we start to couple different services to each other, we lose most of the advantages of a microservice architecture and are left with an excess mess of complexity. So what I suggest is that we use temporary coupling not on individual files, but on a service level. And we look out for surprising patterns like this, where multiple services change together due to a shared library. Or even worse, when multiple services evolve together, like, like this. And if you do a temporal coupling analysis like that regularly, you will be able to detect such warning signs in your architecture early so that you can react on time. 
So, remember that I started out this presentation by talking about organizations. And I would like to take it a step further and actually claim that most organizational problems are mistaken as technical issues. And the main reason for that is because social information is something that's invisible in the code. It's just not there. And in order to tackle those problems, we need to combine our code with social information. Here's one approach. This is a case study of another open source project. This is uh, the development of the Clojure programming language. And this is a visualization called fractal figures. A fractal figures works like this. You consider each file as a box, and each programmer gets assigned a color. And the more that programmer has contributed to code, the larger their area of the box. Now, you can use fractal figures for a lot of different things. For example, if we add a color legend, we get a useful communication tool. Let's say that we join this project. We want to contribute to Clojure, and we want to contribute to the evaluation module in your top left corner. We see that that code is written by Stuart Halloway. So if we have a question about that code, Stuart probably knows a lot about it. We also see that Clojure in general is written by that dark blue developer. So if we have a, that's Rich Hickey. So if we have a question about Clojure in general, well, Rich Hickey probably knows a thing or two about it. But fractal figures are useful even without the color legend, because now we want to look out for surprising patterns like this, where we have 20, 30 different developers contributing to the same piece of code. And the reason we want to look out for that is because research has taught us that the number of developers behind a piece of code is one of the best predictors on the number of quality issues you will find. And fractal figures helps you identify those modules at risk for defects. Fractal figures also explains a lot about our hotspots. Sometimes I come along pretty old code bases, code that's been around for 10, 15 years. And what I tend to find in those code bases is that most of the code is stable. And then we have a number of really red glowing hotspots in the central parts of that code. And when I find something like that, I always look back in time, and I see that those hotspots have been around for years. So the question is, of course, why haven't anyone done anything about them? Why haven't they improved the code? Do you know the reason why much existing code is never improved? The reason is because the fractal figures looks like this. So you have 30 people that work on that code all the time, which means you will impact the work of all those people if you try to redesign that piece. And this leaves us in a very unfortunate situation that I call immutable design. And please, trust me on this one. I'm a functional programmer, but in this context, there's nothing good at all with immutability. And I find it ironic that we cannot improve the code because we have so many people working on it in parallel, and we have to be so many people because we cannot improve the code. All right, let's move on. Let's, we have just talked about knowledge distribution. Let's turn an eye towards our blind spots. And I want to tell you a little story about Paul Phillips that you see here on screen. Paul Phillips used to work on the Scala code base, and he worked on Scala for five years. And during those five years, Paul Phillips was the number one contributor to Scala. Then two years ago, Paul Phillips made this excellent presentation that I really recommend and link there, where he announces his decision to step back and stop contributing to Scala. So I thought this is an excellent opportunity to see what happens when a main developer leaves. So I did a study on knowledge loss. And this is two years after Paul Phillips has left. Here's what the knowledge loss looks like in Scala. You see those red areas? In this case, they don't represent any hotspots. No, they represent abandoned code. That is, code that's written by a developer who's no longer part of the organization. And this is something that you, of course, can use to reason about knowledge distribution. You see that large subsystem to your left? That's something called a compiler, which may be important. But you can also use it a bit more proactively and look for things like this, where you have an entire abandoned subsystem, in this case, the read print loop. 
So use it in case you know that you're planning some features there. Use it to schedule some additional time for learning. Because it is a hugely increased risk to modify code that we no longer understand. All right, I'm at my final observation now. I have found to succeed with maintainable code bases, we need to make it fun. I work at a company called Ampere, and we do most of our development in Clojure. And people often ask me, why did you choose Clojure? And I could, of course, tell them stuff like, yeah, you know, we do data analysis, and Clojure is an excellent tool for data analysis. The thing is, I didn't know that back when we started. I was just lucky. The reason I picked Clojure has nothing to do with technology. I picked Clojure because it looked fun. I wanted to learn the language. And I think that fun is a much underestimated driver of design. In fact, fun is a much underestimated motivator in the software industry, because fun is virtually a guarantee that things get done. So if you work on a large code base, always remember to put the fun into it. Even if you're locked down in your choice of technology and platform, there's always a lot of supporting code to write around it, a lot of tasks to automate. So pick a mundane task, use a technology of your choice to automate it and turn it into a learning experience. Your code is going to thank you for it. So I'm done now, and before I take some questions, I just want to take this opportunity and say thanks a lot for listening to me, and please remember that Common Lisp is a great language. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, so the first question that I had like five times, how can I get this? How, how can I get these metrics myself on my own code base? Yeah, so that's a question that I often get. What kind of tools do I use? And uh, the re I actually use my own tools. And the reason I do that is because when I started out with this, there were no tools available that could do those kind of analyses I wanted to do. So I've wrote my own ones. And uh, last year, I decided to focus full time on that. So uh, I now have my startup, Ampere, where I developed those tools. And we actually have some tools available now. And what will come up soon is a service so that you can actually sign up and get an analysis of all your code for that service. And we are probably launching a preview quite soon. So Sign in if you want to try that only. Does that hook up against GitHub or similar? Yes, it does. Oh, okay, good. So um, another question here is, is number of times that a file was modified really a good measure? Because sometimes you might, within a day, modify a, a file you know, 60 times. Yeah. So there were actually two questions there. First of all, yes, the number of times the file has changed is a really, really good measure. And it's actually backed by empirical research. The number of times a module has changed is a better predictor than any other metric you can mine from the code. But still, it's, uh, of course, important because there may be a huge differences in commit styles between offers on a project. And what I typically recommend is that you try to use a uniform commit style. If you cannot find that, there's an alternative metric that you can use called code churn. So instead of calculating the number of commits, you calculate the amount of code that has changed, and that completely removes the bias uh, possibly introduced by commits. And that's how you extract your metrics? Yes, it is. I use those two. And I tend to, again, stick with the number of commits if, it's, if possible, because it's such a simple metric. It's so intuitive to reason about. So, and the last question here. Uh, can you recommend a good place in the town center to party after the go-to party? Uh, yeah, I know a lot of really good pubs uh, down in the south of Sweden, where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> that won't help you, so now sorry. <laughs> okay. I delegate Thank you. that. Yeah, well, I'm not sure I could help you either. Thanks.